Today is Friday, August 13th, 2021, which means it's Derelict Friday. Hello, fiendlings. How the hell are you? I received the first peek at the Trident cover last night. I think it's a good one to end the series with. Covers are a pain in the ass because as the writer, or even as a fan of any series, you have a preconceived notion of what should be on the front of the book. In the case of Trident, it should have a space station, ships, marines floating in space, creatures attacking them, and massive shadows in the background. Sounds cool, right? Now, try and imagine looking at all of that while the image is the size of two postage stamps. It won't work. Regardless of all the cool stuff you think you need for the image, it really just needs to draw the viewer's attention, be clear about what the book is, regarding its flavor, atmosphere, and etc., and match whatever the genre's typical covers look like. That's the marketing take. The artist take? Bollocks. We want everything! Well, everything isn't always the best thing. It's taken me years to understand that, but it is the truth. Anyway, my Patreon patrons will be getting a gander at the cover next week. Hopefully by then I'll have the full layout for the trade paperback and might even have the graphics I can use for the audiobook cover. We'll see. Apart from that, well, the normal life continues, whatever normal passes for these days. Speaking of normal, at least in regards to this intro, I have a corpse in my cup. Do you? Visit CorpseCoffee.com and get some badass teas and beans, view the webcomic, and tell them the Fiend Master sent you. Now it's time to meet a new ally in the fight for humanity's future. Be safe, have a great week, and we'll talk again real soon. Here's episode 36 of Derelict, Trident. Chapter 58 The world was white again, but Gunny felt as though he'd been asleep in pleasant darkness. The dark didn't hurt, the light did. There was still pain coming from somewhere, but he couldn't feel any part of his body. The pain was in his mind. Thumping, veins pulsing and pushing, the hum of blood in his ears, sounds, the pain disappeared. Gunny mentally sighed in relief and embraced the darkness, but didn't sleep. Thoughts slid over one another in a babble of incoherence, voices all talking over one another, each presenting him with an image that defied logic, fractals of reality that spiraled and spun, making no fucking sense whatsoever. At first, it had been jarring before becoming welcome. Now it was excruciating, it wouldn't cease. The sounds became screaming beeps that immediately faded to a dull and distant pulse. Beat, beat, beep, beep, beat, beep, beep, beat, beep. Silence. No sound. The images fading away into nothing and leaving him once more in the comfortable cradle of darkness. Gunny rested there, waiting for everything to end or begin again. His finger trembled. Gunny felt a surface beneath him. Felt. He twitched his toes, reveling in the tactile sensation of skin on skin. A glow. He didn't know how long ago the dawn had started, but it was reassuring. Rosy-fingered dawn, Gunny said aloud. The words didn't echo, but they didn't fall into dead space, either. I just spoke, he realized. He remembered the confused images, the strange avatars visiting him in the dark, peppering him with questions, and every time he tried to form words to communicate, nothing worked. They disappeared into shadow storms of thought before he could properly form them, but he'd been able to send images. Send. Images. Where? The glow increased slightly before stars twinkled in the darkness. Gunny turned his head and saw more stars in the eerie blue glow of the planet Neptune. He was standing atop a massive block of Atmos steel, struts and supports holding it in place. The dawn he'd seen with Homeric eyes were the crimson readouts floating on a hollow display console set into the block. He turned in a slow circle and saw the shadowy form of Trident Station. The tubes connecting it to the shipyards had been destroyed in places, and the gaps shimmered. Gunny frowned before realizing he stood in space wearing nothing but his sergeant's uniform. He patted at his body, expecting to feel frost clinging to his skin. No, he was warm, comfortable. There was no sound here, but that was all right. He didn't want to hear what space had to say. The shimmers in the station tubes meant only one thing. The creatures were here. 
they'd somehow made it to Trident Station. How? He remembered the skiff and the beacon. He remembered light, and then only white. What the fuck had happened? Gunny glanced down at the console. The display showed dozens of reactor rings powering up, although he wasn't sure what that meant. It was a sergeant, not a void-damned engineer. The floor structure vibrated beneath him. It was like being atop a sleeping dragon as it slowly came awake from a horrible dream. He could practically hear the rumble. He expected something to happen to his body, but nothing occurred. Gunny lifted his hands and stared through them to the deck. I'm a ghost? His eyes detected a flash of light and he looked up. The eye that he'd seen in the darkness, the one whose voice had sounded so familiar. Then he remembered the flashes, the universe opening up to him, everything they'd shown him before he'd become whatever he was now. Now that he was no longer in a state of perpetual mental panic fueled by that white pain, he placed the memory of the voice. Fortunas. The eye's colors glowed a pleasant yellow. You're not a ghost, but you are dead. Gunny took that in for a moment. He turned his gaze slightly to peer out over the hordes of creatures hiding in Trident Station's shadows. Then what am I? He felt Portunus's presence, the eye that looked so alien appearing near his shoulder. A gestalt, Portunus said, or put simply, a memory frozen in time that contains your personality and the many traits we've gathered over the decades. The being's voice reverberated around him, both comforting and professional, at the same time. You are no longer human, Gunny Cartwright. A simulation. Yes, Portunus said. Experience continues. Life does not. He stared down at his hands once more, the flesh growing nearly invisible before snapping back as if solid. He stumbled backward a step. I... Portunus said nothing, the eye floating in the same space it had been, its unblinking gaze staring out over the debris field orbiting the station. A wave of nausea swept over him, but quickly drained away. The world around him rippled with static, the images fragmenting. Calm, Portunus said. Reality, if he could call it that, bounced back into place, the world's puzzle piece configuration healing itself. Not human, he whispered. No, Portunus answered. In time, humanity will have a name for your existence. All those religions he'd studied... The lessons taught to him in Dome 7 regarding spirituality, integration with the universe, life after death, the promises of greater beings such as Yahweh, Allah, and Jehovah flooded back across his consciousness. Gunny began to laugh. The laugh slowly transformed into a lonely, miserable sob. Fortunus said nothing. After a moment, Cartwright managed to pull himself together. His subconscious had halted the swell of emotion by saying, you're fucking dead. Get over it and see what's next. He wiped at his face and he could feel humanity slipping away, or at least the part that cared for such things. It was amazing how quickly it had happened, that nearly audible click from making the decision to accept what had happened and was still happening. Gunny widened his vision and realized he could see in a spherical 360. He could view everything from certain vantage points in all directions and make sense of it. But when he reached a certain point, the vision became distorted and rippled. What? Imperfect, Portunus said. We do not have enough microsatellites to provide more detail, and this area will soon become unstable. Unstable how? Portunus said nothing, but the shimmer in the wrecked bowels of Trident Station seemed to increase slightly. What do you want me to do? The eye blinked and appeared a meter before him, tendrils of light spilling from its edges like long, thin fingers. Want is not a question, Portunus said. I am here to explain your options and help you in what you want to do. Gunny said nothing as the thoughts swirled in his mind. He peered down and saw the hollow display below him. Large words glowed a steady green. Printers online. Chapter 59 Kelly cycled the hatch release. When the status light turned green, she held it in place with a locked mag glove. She pulled the probe from her pouch and held it before her. I'll escort the cam feed to your block. Copy, Dickerson said. She gently pushed on the hatch and it swung open a few centimeters. 
Pursuit lights, as dim as she could make them, illuminated whirls of debris from shattered carapaces, and she couldn't help but grin. When you were armed and knew what could be coming at you, it was a little easier to defend yourself. Of course, neither of them had much ammo, and considering what she'd just experienced, Kelly had a feeling there were thousands of starfish and Void knew what else lurking throughout the QM modules. Nesting. Growing. Waiting. For what? She remembered Red all too well. Not so much what happened at the end, but the brief glimpse the nanoprobe had provided them before the starfish feasting on the nuclear material finally destroyed the ship. How long before the starfish and the others reached whatever state of metamorphosis the one in Red had? What would be the area of effect? Corporal? Dickerson asked. Yeah, she said, sending it now. She let the nanoprobe slip through her fingers and watched as it autocorrected its yaw, pitch, and roll in the microgravity. A feed immediately appeared on her HUD. She shared it with Dickerson, took a deep breath, and piloted the probe through the hatch. The oppressive darkness gave away little to the probe's tightly focused light array. Kelly spun the probe in the middle of the corridor, giving every sensor and camera a chance to survey the area. The analyses came back quickly. No baddies, Kelly said. Dickerson harumphed. For how many meters? She shrugged and moved the probe further down the corridor. Before, when they were jetting for their lives, neither of them had been looking for airlocks. The last thing either of them had wanted was to go outside of the station where they could easily be scooped up by a horde of starfish or pine cones. The very thought made her shiver. Now it was their only option if they wanted to survive, and Kali didn't want to die here. Not like this, and not from being burned to a crisp by radiation without firing a shot in anger first. She was sure Dickerson felt the same way. She gave the probe's propulsion system a kick, and the probe moved down the corridor at less than a meter per second. Kali altered its attitude, and the probe turned to face the outer corridor. In silence, she watched the cam feeds looking for an egress. Maybe a short corridor leading to... On the floor was a bright yellow slash. They must have missed it with their lights off. You see that, Corporal? Aye, she whispered with a grin and brought the probe to a halt. She rotated the device and pointed its nose toward the ceiling. There, seemingly embedded in the Atmos steel, was a large rectangular hatch. A maintenance hatch, to be specific. The airlock would be suffocatingly tight for the pair of them dressed in two suits, but they wouldn't have a problem getting out, assuming the hatch still worked. Dickerson, is that for module bridging? He let out a sound that rumbled low in his throat. Guess so. All this shit was built long before our parents' parents were old enough to think about having kids. I know a lot about Trinam, but that ain't really saying much when you've only been here a few years and haven't explored jack shit of the main QM and shipyards. Once we get out of here, where do we head? Callie asked. Dickerson was quiet for a moment. I'm willing to bet we're easily more than a click away from the cylinder slip point the captain took. And they've either reached the med bay by now or are getting close. We could try and make our way over there, but... He trailed off. She didn't need him to finish. The creatures had attacked that area, driven she and Dickerson deeper into the QM bays, and whatever had attacked the cylinder had been massive. Going back there? Not a good idea. And we have to go through that mess to get to the medical bays. Yep. Dickerson said. So, uh, how do you feel about visiting the shipyards? Kelly blinked. We don't have enough fuel to make it that far. Shit, Corporal, we don't have enough fuel to go anywhere. She bit her lip. He was right. They had bingo fuel, near bingo ammo, and no air support. But staying here? Still not an option. We're going to walk it. Yep, Dickerson said. He groaned dramatically and Mag hopped forward his rifle pointing through the hatch's gap. You'll get to critique my style. You should see my reports, Kelly said. She tried to sound gruff, but she couldn't hide the smile in her voice. How long of a walk? Three clicks, Max. Be a lot easier once we're no longer a dual ply. Got that right. Kelly wanted to open the hatch wide and get moving, but she hesitated. Too easy, she told herself. She rotated the probe again, this time setting the radiation filtering to high. A few beats, and the radiation counter drifted slightly higher, then slowly descended. Damn it, she said. Dickerson had obviously seen the same thing. So our friends are nearby. Could just be one, she said, but she didn't believe it. Right, and 
Gunny might one day bake me a cake. She winced, but said nothing. An awkward silence lasted a few beats before she felt she could speak without sounding strangled with emotion. Going to pilot it further down, see what's what. Copy. She pushed away the image she had of the older Marine, his face pockmarked and lined from one fight or another, and a patch covering where his eye used to be. She hoped they managed to save him. Shit, she hoped the rest of Black Company had made it to the med bay. After marking the maintenance hatch and airlock on her HUD, she turned the probe and headed deeper into the gloom. Another 15 or 20 meters, and she'd come to a bulkhead separating the QM modules from the station interior. The probe didn't make it five more meters. The radiation spiked so high that the probe sensors all peaked before the probe feed went out as if someone flipped a switch. Shit, did it hit a wall of rads? That's what it looked like, Kelly said. Suggestions? Um... Dickerson broke off. We get the fuck out of here before it gets closer and fries us? Kelly found herself nodding before she managed to process what he'd said. They had to move. Whatever caused that wall of rads could decide to move toward them at any moment. When that happened, they'd have no way out. Going to flip out of here, bounce off the bulkhead, and try and get as close to the hatch as we can. I like it. Stupid, but ballsy. Got anything better? Apart from adding a pirouette at the end? No. She grinned. You're an asshole. I know. He sounded like he was smiling. Kelly cut her mag gloves power and the hatch stayed in place. She let out a breath she didn't know she'd been holding and attached her free hand to the bulkhead next to the hatch. Going to kick it wide and push on out. Give me a second or two and follow. Copy, Corporal. Here goes nothing, she said to herself. She used her attached mag glove like a fulcrum and swung herself feet first at the open hatch. The hatch swung out into the corridor and Kelly released her maglocked hand. She flew through the hatchway at an angle toward the far bulkhead. As quickly as she could, she spun so her mag boots faced the bulkhead. Just before her feet touched the Atmos steel, she activated her mag boots and was pulled to the metal. She quickly bent her knees, deactivated the boots, and sprang forward. She flew through the microgravity faster than she'd expected, and had to hurry a little to make sure she didn't slam into the next bulkhead face first. Kelly half somersaulted and pointed her feet back to the bulkhead, only to repeat the process with her mag boots. She caught sight of Dickerson flying out of the maintenance closet and toward the bulkhead. His leg, the one that had been mangled by the creature, hung at an odd angle as he flew. Kelly barely registered that as she pivoted and hit the next bulkhead. Another bounce, and she'd be right in front of the maintenance airlock. Her radiation alarm began going off. If she hadn't changed its thresholds, it would have been a constant, annoying flash on her HUD. But at these settings? Her last bounce didn't go as well. Between the alarm chime, her flashing HUD, and the impossible-to-ignore urge to swing her helmet to stare into the yawning darkness, she made the last hit flat-footed. Her knees took the shock, but they weren't happy about it. Had she been paying attention, she would have flexed her knees instead of holding them ram-voiding rod straight into the bulkhead. A surprised oomph escaped her lips as the pain stabbed through her nerves. At least it got her attention, as she managed to hit the deck without hurting herself. She turned up the mag boots to full and moored herself just in front of the maintenance airlock. With one eye on the rear cam to check on Dickerson, she faced the corridor and whatever creatures had gotten close enough to increase the rads. Kelly killed her suit lights, and a moment later, Dickerson landed in an awkward heap behind her. When he spoke, he sounded breathless and in pain. Well, that didn't go well. Your leg fucked? Fucked. He agreed. Not good for much other than propping me up in ZG. I can probably... Dickerson paused. What's that? The Seaver count drifted higher. Kelly had been staring at her rear cam to see her squad mate instead of keeping her eyes on the corridor before her. She swung her eyes and her mouth dropped open. The corridor of absolute darkness had begun to shimmer. Without saying a word, she turned, grabbed Dickerson by the waist, and pulled. There was a brief moment of resistance before the large marine killed his mag boots. He floated free and she gently swung him into the maintenance airlock entryway. She held on to him and released her boots, and they floated together through the gloom to the recessed airlock hatch. The radiation monitors were trending upward. Whatever was down the corridor had either sensed them and was approaching, or it was about to transform like the one aboard Red. The pair of Marines hit the hatch and crumpled, Dickerson shrieking in pain over the mic. Kelly didn't ask if he was okay. 
She crawled up the hatch until she could reach the manual release. She pumped it three times and the airlock opened. Dickerson was already trying to rise, his damaged leg flopping at the knee. She turned to help him but froze. The shimmer, so much like white noise threading through a dead screen, pulsed with zigs and zags like lightning strikes. They coalesced for a beat into the shape of a tooth-filled maw. Kelly maglocked herself to Dickerson's shoulder and leaped into the airlock, slamming the cycle button as they floated through. The airlock inner door closed, but not before she saw something that looked like an eye peering at her from the silent crackle and spit of chain lightning. She spun and gathered Dickerson as best she could. The force of the leap took them all the way to the airlock's terminus, and the impact gave her a hell of a jolt before she maglocked her feet to the airlock's inner door. She tried to speak, but she couldn't get enough air. Calm, she told herself. Calm. They were behind a thick plate of Atmos steel and about as safe from the radiation as they were going to get in this area. Calm. Dickerson? Still here. My leg is trashed, and I mean trashed. I saw, Kelly said. How's the pain? Not good, he said. I think my nannies are getting close to exhaustion already. That starfish really fucked me. You're just lucky it didn't coat you with silver. Copy that, Dickerson said, although it sounded as though he were speaking through clenched teeth. The radiation levels had dropped significantly once they were out of the corridor and behind another shielded plate, but it was still high. Now it was crawling upward again. Kelly flipped on her thermal cams, set the thresholds to maximum, and looked at the inner hatch. Its edges glowed with impossibly bright flames. We have to move, she said. Yeah, I figured, but Corporal, we gotta ditch these extra suits. No way we can possibly get around like this. She sighed. Okay, but how the void are we going to get you out of yours, especially with your leg? You got a blade, Corporal. Get to work. Her radiation sensors ticked up another few sieverts. Right, 